you for joining us for this screencast, part one in a series on hepatic steatosis. In this screencast, we will review the pathophysiology of hepatic steatosis. At the end of this screencast, you should be able to describe the pathophysiology of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and cirrhosis, the reason that alcohol can cause steatohepatitis, and understand a little bit about the concept of transient steatosis. Let's talk about hepatic steatosis. So there are different forms of hepatic steatosis, with diffuse steatosis being the most common pattern. And right now in the United States, approximately 25% of the population can be found to have some form of diffuse steatosis. Steatohepatitis, which is an inflammation related to diffuse steatosis, can lead to fibrosis and cirrhosis in about 10 to 20% of patients. Other more atypical forms of steatosis are not as common as diffuse steatosis, and they can often be a diagnostic challenge because they can look wedge-shaped or mass-like or multifocal and can sometimes be confused with other pathologic entities. Steatosis can be diagnosed with relatively high confidence on ultrasound, CT, and MRI. It can be diffuse, geographic, focal, or multifocal, but typically there is not mass effect. I have seen rare cases where there is mass effect, but typically you shouldn't have mass effect. Vessels classically will pass through areas of steatosis unaltered, where a neoplasm tends to alter the course or the caliber of a vessel. When steatosis is focal, it tends to be non-circular or wedge-shaped. On ultrasound, we're going to identify steatosis as areas of increased echogenicity. That increased echogenicity can be compared relative to the renal cortex, increased echogenicity that results in loss of periportal fat, or increased echogenicity that results in hyperattenuation of the liver that reduces penetration of our ultrasound beam and it obscures the diaphragm. On CT, we're looking for areas of hypoattenuation or decreased density. On a non-contrast CT, you can measure the Hounsfield units in the spleen, compare those to the Hounsfield units of the liver, and a, a difference of 10 Hounsfield units is indicative of steatosis. On a portal venous phase CT, a difference between the spleen and the liver of 20 to 25 Hounsfield units indicates steatosis. And then just measuring the liver on a non-contrast CT, if the absolute Hounsfield units of the liver are less than 40 Hounsfield units, any of those meet criteria for steatosis. One pitfall is you do not want to be comparing the spleen to the liver on the arterial phase because the spleen will be much more hyperdense or hyperenhancing relative to the liver in that arterial phase. On MRI, we're going to be comparing our in and opposed phased imaging. You're going to measure signal intensities with ROIs in the liver and the spleen, and a signal drop of greater than 15% is going to be within the range of steatosis. You'll also notice that the liver is going to be sort of mildly T1 hyperintense and T2 hyperintense on non-fat saturated imaging and may show hypointensity on fat saturated imaging. When we think about the causes of steatosis, they are quite varied. We do see cases of idiopathic steatosis where a patient is not obese and, and does not uh, have any other risk factors for, for steatosis. But I would say the most common causes for steatosis are going to be alcohol use and obesity. And with obesity come all of the other uh, sort of metabolic syndrome spectrum abnormalities like diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and insulin resistance which all are felt to contribute to the development of steatosis. Steatosis has been associated with uh, radiation to the liver, so liver-directed radiation such as external beam therapy, although I'd say that's a relatively rare cause of steatosis. Certainly steroid intake can cause steatosis and can cause it quite acutely. During pregnancy, there is an increased uh, incidence of steatosis and then we know that there are a number of drugs, particularly 
chemotherapy drugs that do induce steatosis and, and even steatohepatitis with some of the most common ones that we see in our oncology patients listed here. Amiodarone can also cause steatosis. Interestingly, amiodarone is associated with an increased density in the liver, uh, most commonly or classically. When we think about why does steatosis occur? What is the pathophysiology of steatosis? Well, there are multiple different sources of intracellular lipid, and those are listed there on the side. So certainly we know that both dietary fat uh, and, and dietary carbohydrates are going to be absorbed through the bowel into the liver and then can be either stored as fatty acids and triglycerides or in the case of carbohydrates, be converted to lipid. Systemic glucose, so your serum glucose, can also be converted into lipid for storage by de novo lipogenesis. And then systemic fatty acids and triglycerides can be directly stored by the hepatocytes. Now, why does this lead to inflammation? Why does this lead to abnormality? Well, as, as you get increasing lipid accumulation, you start to get impaired beta oxygenation and ketogenesis, which are some of the forms in which our hepatocytes process lipid. If we look a little more closely at how this lipid accumulation leads to inflammation, you start with a normal hepatocyte. You then get this hyperlipidemia and hyperglycemia, and you get ballooning of the hepatocytes. And, the, and as you get ballooning of the hepatocytes, you get increased free fatty acids, and that results in oxidative stress within the hepatocyte. That oxidative stress is going to cause free radical formation. It's going to cause peroxidation of lipids, and, and it's going to essentially damage the hepatocyte and even damage the cell membrane. That damaged hepatocyte is then going to create pro-inflammatory signals. Those pro-inflammatory signals will recruit white blood cells, particularly macrophages, and then those, that, those activated white blood cells can then stimulate the hepatic stellate cell, and those hepatic stellate cells are what then lead to fibrosis. So it is a stepwise process from accumulation of lipid to a damaged hepatocyte to activation of those stellate cells that produce fibrosis. When we think about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we can think of it also in sort of a stepwise progression. Initially, increased caloric intake is going to be the largest risk factor. That increased caloric intake leads to obesity. Obesity can cause insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. That insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia then is going to trigger lipogenesis, increased free fatty acids, and hyperglycemia. And if we go back to some of the slides we looked at before, that's what leads to the fatty liver. That's what leads to ballooning of the hepatocytes, hepatocyte damage, and eventually fibrosis. Here's a case of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. We have a 43-year-old man, BMI 30, no alcohol use. And he's presenting with some abdominal pain, some mild AST and ALT elevation, and, and a negative hepatitis panel. We can see on the ultrasound that the patient has increased echogenicity of the liver. We compare that to the renal cortex here. We can see that the liver is markedly echogenic compared to the renal cortex. We also have loss of periportal fat in most locations, although maybe we can see a touch of periportal fat here. Also notice this hyperechogenicity leads to attenuation of our ultrasound beam and obscuration or poor penetration to the deeper parts of the liver. We can resolve a little bit of the diaphragm here, so I wouldn't quite call this severe, but I would call this at least moderate severity hepatic steatosis. When we then looked at this patient on MRI imaging, we have our in-phased imaging and our opposed phased imaging, and you can see a dramatic loss of signal on the opposed phased imaging compared to the in-phased imaging. 
That was a signal intensity loss of approximately 35% consistent with a moderate to severe stenosis, steatosis. Now, this patient uh, was given a number of uh, lifestyle modifications and put on an intensive weight loss program. And they did have some normalization of that AST and ALT, which indicates maybe they were having some decreased steatohepatitis or inflammation related to diffuse steatosis. When we think about alcoholic steatohepatitis and why it occurs, it has a lot to do with the liver utilizing resources to process ethanol. So when you uh, consume ethanol, that ethanol is going to be broken down by alcohol dehydrogenase. And in that process, you're going to convert NAD to NADH. Well, accumulation of high levels of NADH is going to inhibit the beta oxygenation of fatty acids. And like we heard before, when you inhibit that beta oxygenation of fatty acids, you can get free radical formation, and that free radical formation can then result in peroxidation and uh, can lead to that steatohepatitis, in this case, an alcoholic steatohepatitis. You also have, from ethanol, increased lipogenesis because some of that ethanol may be converted to lipid for storage. And you also have impaired export of your very low density lipoproteins from the hepatocytes. So all of this is gonna to lead to oxidative stress and that oxidative stress, again, is gonna result in damage to hepatocytes that will cause pro-inflammatory signals to activate the stellate cells and result in fibrosis. Here's a case of alcohol-induced steatohepatitis. So this was a 45-year-old man he had chronic alcohol dependence and was presenting with altered mental status. We can see that his liver is very low in attenuation, almost as low as the subcutaneous or mesenteric fat. And, and just compare right, the spleen here to the liver here. And I would say that in severe alcohol-induced steatosis, those are the most fatty livers um, that, that we see in general practice. In this case, the Hounsfield unit difference between the liver and the spleen was 80. And notice that his, he was actually acutely intoxicated at a very high level when he presented, and, and that's on top of the chronic alcohol use. In summary, steatosis is a very common condition in patients, certainly in America, undergoing medical imaging. And we can diagnose it with a relatively high degree of confidence on ultrasound, CT, or MRI. The accumulation of intracellular lipid within the hepatocytes leads to impaired beta oxygenation, peroxidation of the hepatocytes and lipids, and that results in inflammation. That inflammation is what then can lead to what is referred to as NAFLD or non-fatty non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and cirrhosis, or alcoholic fatty liver disease and cirrhosis. In terms of the underlying etiologies, they are broad, but certainly alcohol use, obesity, diabetes, steroid, and chemotherapy are going to be some of the most common uh, etiologies that we're going to encounter routinely in clinical practice. Thank you for your time. I hope you found this screencast informative, and I hope you will join us for part two and part three. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel if you are enjoying the content.